you know, my first touch, I picked up the ball and Patrick Vieira was standing in front of me. And I'm thinking, I, I cannot take this guy on. Like, there's no way around this guy. I ended up playing a one-two around him. That was all I thought I could do. So we, we're in a team meeting and, and I remember my lines clearly. And what I had to say was, um, he wasn't there obviously. So I'm like, question boss, where's Santiago? And I can see you two looking at me now thinking, how was that cut? Um, but it was... It... <laughs> <laughs> Oscar, Oscar worthy, mate. Yeah. Oscar worthy. <laughs> I was there, Kieran Dyer and Lee Bowie had the fight and I'm sat in the in the stands because I, I didn't even make the bench. I'm looking around thinking, Nicky Butter just got injured as well. I think there's no one else. Graham Suness has got to play me, like, surely. Yes, people, yes, people, yes, people. Welcome back to the We Talk Football podcast. Back like we never left. How are you doing, Quakes? I'm all good, brother. How are you doing? I'm really well, thank you, mate. Today, we've got the pleasure of being joined by ex-professional footballer, Darren Ambrose. How are you doing, Darren? I'm very good, thank you, Jamie. Very good, Quaku. I've got to say, Jamie, Quaku is one of the hardest working guys I know at Talk Sport. So, absolute pleasure to be on here with you two. Stop he's... it, mate. You're making, you're making me blush. You're making me blush. <laughs> make, he's not Talk Sport, blush. he's on my screens on Sky Sport. <laughs> <laughs> Six. So I suppose, yeah, I mean, I've known Quakey, what, 20 odd years. I mean, he's uh, he's grafting his ass off at Talk Sports, so fair play to him, but you're making a black man blush. You are making a black man <laughs> blush right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Darren, let's take it back. Let's take it back to the, the start. How did you get your start in football? Oh, man, you know what? It, it, it happened early, you know, not as early as it is now. Like, my son plays in the academy at Ipswich now and he signed up when he was five and that that is so so early but yeah I've never known anything differently to, to wanting to become a football player from from the moment I can remember you know my dad was very strong on it I lost my dad last October so all these memories get brought back a lot for me and he, he was very strong on um, improving everything about my game not once did he ever tell me that you're going to be a football player but I, I know as time went on, that he he was confident that I had the talent, I had the ability, just needed nurturing. So, yeah, I remember from early days being out on the field, like, with my dad. He, he was a fireman. He was a policeman, then a fireman. Uh, joined the police force because he couldn't get into the fire brigade. So he wanted, he wanted to join the police force to get into the fire brigade, which, which was clever, really, how he'd done it. So he used to work nights a lot, and he was always tired, but he'd always come in and say, right, we're, we're going to the field, and... You know, he'd always have me practicing all my weaknesses, which which was very smart of him. Um, so, yeah, from from early on. And then I remember joining West Ham when I was about 10, I think, uh, trained at Wolfham Abbey. And they never, you know, I played a few games for them. They never really stepped up and, and, and they were signing a lot of players on contracts, only year contracts. And, you know, I was always, look, just come back to training, come back to training. And, and then we played a training game against Ipswich. And I remember it was Colin Suggett. He was the um, he was like the academy director at the time, and he, he called my parents into the office and said, "Look, I know West Ham have got you. I know they're not offering you nothing, but you know we're willing to to go as as high as eight years." Like, and I mean, I was 10, 10, 11, and my parents laughed and they were like, "We're not signing you on for eight years. Like, don't be silly." But just to show that commitment I ended up signing a year with 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 Ipswich and and it just happened from there really I absolutely loved it there's a catchment area now and I'm, I know I'm waffling on but my boy is obviously in the academy now it's a catchment area within an hour of Ipswich now it wasn't like that back when I was I was growing up and uh, I, I think I was an hour and a half and my parents always got me there every Wednesday every Saturday sometimes every Monday always drove me there and as a kid, you know what it's like, you don't realise the struggles that they went through. And, you know, now growing up, I, I look back on it and think, oh, that, that must have been tough times for them. You know, I mean, it wasn't £200 a litre like it is now in, in fuel terms, but it was, <laughs> it, 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 was, it was tough times. But, you know, credit to them. They got me there when, whenever they could. Well, I mean, firstly, I mean, sorry for your loss, of course. And it sounded like your dad was like a driving force mm. um, and you had like a support, supportive environment around you and, and that was key to you becoming pro. So obviously your dad saw the talent, by the sounds of it, in you a lot, you know, a long time before you saw it yourself. When was the first time that you realised that you had the ability yourself to become a professional footballer? Um, I mean, I, you, I, you always feel as a kid that, 
you know, you're going to be a footballer. I know all the kids that do now, you know, as you know, I've got five kids. One of them's young, the rest are at school. So every child that they know, every boy, every girl that, that loves football is saying, Look, I'm, I'm going to be a football player. So I was always one of those anyway, a little bit cocky at school, a little bit cocksure of myself, you know, always, I'm going to be a footballer. I don't, I was, I was good academically, but a little bit cocky in terms of, I don't need to do anything because I'm going to be a footballer. But I think the real first time Colin Suggett had left, Brian Clue had come in at Ipswich, he was the new academy director, and I was moved into the youth team under, I think it was under 18s at the time, and I was 14. And um, I, I won a penalty in that game. I played really well. I was only 14. I won a penalty, and I took the penalty. I missed. I mean, it was <laughs> it was... It was an insane moment and very disappointing. I was so young and I grabbed the ball and a couple of players trying to get it off me. I was like, no, I'm taking it and end up getting it saved. But at the end of the game, there was Brian Clues, Paul Goddard, who was the, the manager of the youth team. I'm nervous, by the way. And he slaughtered the rest of the players and not me. And he was saying that this kid's got something. He's got the ability and he's got the bottle to take the penalty and step up. I don't care he missed. We need to see a bit more of that from you guys. So from that moment on, I thought, you know what, I've, I've got a chance because I, I had the mentality to, to get there. I mean, I, I'll touch upon a little bit of mentality a little bit later and how I didn't really have the mentality. But at the time, I felt like I did. And that was the moment that I thought, I've got, I've got a chance here. You, you see that a lot, a lot in, in youth football. It's like the kids who've got the mentality, that's what separates them from the other kids. Because obviously there's a base level of talent and you clearly had that. Um, but the kids who kind of go on to make it, the kids are just sure of themselves, that natural confidence, whether it displays itself in the classroom, it displays itself in the football pitch, just have to have like a bit about you. You, me you mentioned like your family and your boy who plays football. Do you see that in him as well, in terms of the confidence that he has in his ability and what he does when he goes out on the football pitch? Um, not really, no. I'd love to say I do. And I I'm going to be totally honest, I don't really. And I think there's a big difference. And it's, it's the upbringing. You know, I, I was brought up in, in Harlow in Essex, a little bit of a rough area. You know, my mum and dad struggled and, and I used to go, and I was only talking to my wife about this today. I used to go out, we used to play at school. I used to go up, there was a place called The Cage where I used to live and you'd go, I'd go every day, I'd go up there. And, you know, it would, it would all be ripped up and that, but it wouldn't matter. And I'd be seven, eight, nine, ten, and there'd be 13, 14, 15 year olds there you know, and I'd get smashed around, you know, if I'm trying to nutmeg a 15 year old where I grew up, I'd be getting smashed around, but it made you tough. I'd come home, I'd be grazed up, I'd have grazed up face and stuff. We were taking a little smack here, here and there. And my dad's like, look, get on with it. This is, this is what it is. And I don't see that in my child because, you know, he's got a, a little bit more privileged upbringing than I had. So it's different to back then. They don't really go out and play anymore. They've got computers, they've got iPads and stuff like this. And it's, this is all kids. This isn't just myself, my own kids. But I try and get it out of him a little bit more and try and try and say that, try and believe you need this. Yeah, you, you don't want it, you need it. And that's what I was when I grew up. I needed to be a footballer. I didn't just want it, I needed it. And I don't see it in a lot of kids, to be honest, I, I used to coach in uh, Ipswich before I stopped. I don't see it in a lot of them because everyone has a little bit more privileged upbringing than, than I did when I was growing up. Well, like you clearly provided uh, a, a quality like way of life for your kids as a result of the profession and hard work you put in. And what's that saying? It's uh, it's hard to it's difficult to wake up and do the work when you're waking up in silk sheets. So yeah. like it's 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 naturally going to be more difficult for a son of a footballer or a daughter of a footballer to go on and follow in their in their dad's footsteps just because life is a little bit more comfortable for them. But like if you look at your situation and you fast forward, obviously progress through the youth team and fast forward to 2002 when you made your first team debut for Ipswich. Like, tell us what that was like. Take us there in terms of putting on that shirt for a team that you've represented for such a long time at youth levels. Making your first team debut, was that probably one of the proudest moments of your career? Yeah, you know what? Just, uh, I mean, just quickly going back, sorry. On, on the flip side to, to Harry being like, yeah, you know, born, born privileged, which, which he kind of was. It's also difficult because his dad used to be a football player. Now, when... when when he's in even in Ipswich youth team, it, it, it is hard because everyone looks at he's going to always be the best player or he's definitely going to make it and it doesn't work like that. So on the flip side, I think it is quite an eye opener for him and he has to be, he has to, 
he has to be better than everyone by quite a distance to to be seen as as the best player because otherwise it's oh it's it's the son of a football player he's always going to be good so I just wanted to touch on that because it's difficult for for a dad like that but yeah look fast forward onto the um my my debut it I, I always wanted to be a footballer as, as I said and I got to sixteen I, I moved up there in in digs I stayed with with Bentley we used to live together and he was always talking that we're going to be the two that that are going to come through. We ended up having a couple more, but I remember being in the squad a few times. Um, and then I see Bentley make his debut. I think he scored his, his first Premier League goal. I think it was Middlesbrough. And, you know, we used to live together. It was, it was an unbelievable feeling for me to, to grow up from 11, 12 with Bentley and he makes his debut. But I always, the back of my mind, was thinking, I'm next, for sure, I'm next. And I was training, always doing well in training. And then we went to Highbury. Um, just to like George Burley was like right go and warm up you're coming on and like the feeling it wasn't even nerves it was like I cannot wait to get on this football pitch like this is this is what I've lived for this is what I've been growing up this is why I was cocky at school this is everything like and then I'm not gonna lie so the nerves didn't kick in till I was standing on the edge and you know my name was there and then I went when I ran on that's when I started to feel a little bit nervous and you know, my first touch, I picked up the ball and Patrick Vieira is standing in front of me. And I'm thinking, I, I cannot take this guy on. Like, there's no way around this guy. I ended up playing a one-two around him. That was all I thought I could do. And um, yeah, and then I, I had a chance. So I got on for about 12 minutes. I had a chance, opportunity. It was 1v1, David Seaman standing in goal, honestly. And it was a, uh, talk about eye-opener for my kids. This was an eye-opener for me that I'm not good enough yet. Because he stood there in front of me, I see no area of the goal that I could hit, and I ended up just chipping it into his arms, and and we missed, we we I missed the opportunity, and yeah, we got relegated that day. It was my, it was my debut. It's the strangest feeling. It's my debut at Highbury. We lost two 0 We got relegated, and we're in the dressing room, and everyone's down. Obviously, we just got relegated from the Premier League. Everyone's like, a few tears are being shed, and everyone's, and I'm I'm in the back of my mind. I'm thinking. This could be positive for me, you know. Like next season, I could start the league. Like I'm looking around, thinking he could leave, he could leave. This is me in the team. So the selfish side of me was thinking, this is my opportunity. I need to grasp yeah. this. So it was, it was an unbelievable feeling in, in all accounts for me. Yeah, and to jump on that, it turned out to be somewhat of a breakout season for you because I think you made like 37 appearance over that season. I think you scored like 11 goals or something like that, which prompted the move to Newcastle um yeah. and I think I obviously ahead of the interview I was doing a bunch of research and there was some comments saying that you were sad to leave Ipswich and I can understand that because it's a club that you spent the best part of of 10 years at and it's your, mm. it's your it's your boyhood club so to speak but what is it like you know God rest his soul Buddy Robson you know gives you a call on the phone saying I want you to come to Newcastle what what's that like for a dynamic I mean to, to start with he didn't actually phone me I didn't speak to Sir Bobby and and until probably until I said no now it was strange because my my agent was dealing with it Freddie Shepherd was was the man that was speaking to him the, the the chairman at Newcastle and he said right Newcastle want to speak to us there was a few clubs but I'd seen Titus Bramble go to Newcastle I'd seen Kieran Dyer go to Newcastle it was kind of a progression for Ipswich players because Sir Bobby Robson loved Ipswich obviously statue outside Portman Road so I was like well let's go and, I'll go and speak to him and uh, my last game for Wolves, I basically thought that this again against Wolves, this could be me. Um, so yeah, we 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 flew up there. Me and my dad flew up there, and, and we spoke to Freddie Shepherd and the chief executive. I can't remember his name. And I kind of just had um, itchy feet. I was thinking, you know what? I don't really want to sign. I want to go back. And my agent was like, "What? I, this is Newcastle." It was the. It was honestly, it was insane. It was like. I know they they struggled a bit recently, but it was like turning up to like a, a one of the biggest clubs in Europe, which they were in the Champions League at the time. Walking up to St James's Park in the middle of Newcastle was like wow, like and I got a little bit nervous, you know. And I hadn't even signed, and I was like, I, I don't really want to do it. So um, I, I, I told this story the other day. I went out, uh, got got some lunch, went out to Jesmond, an Italian place in Jesmond, and Alan Shearer has walked into the to the restaurant and. He's, he's come up to me and he's like, oh, like, have you spoke to the club? And I'm thinking, wow, he knows who I am. Like, <laughs> seven, six, seven years ago, I'm watching him at Euro 96 when I was like 12. And he's like, right, you make sure you get back and, and, and sign the contract. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. So I'm going to sign now. Um, but I, I still hadn't met Sir Bobby Robson. 
Um, so then I'm like, right, let, let's go back. Let, let's see. Um, Shearer dealt with a bill, it, which was ridiculous. He was like, can we have the bill? And he was like, oh, it's already been squared. And he just literally put his arm up and was like, that's it, squared, bill's done. So uh, <laughs> went back and I was still like, I'm going to say no. My agent was, what? And honestly, it was about, I'd say it was about seven o'clock in the evening. Flight was at about nine. We're going back. We just had a message. My agent had just had a message and he showed me. It was Arsene Wenger. And it was like, don't sign, come and talk to me. Bobby Robson swings the door open. First time I met him, we sat there, must have been till one in the morning. He knew everything about me. He knew, he'd come and watch me against Grimsby Town, away from home. Um, Steve Cabber scored a hat-trick. It was, it, was, it was one of my worst games. And he knew everything I'd done in that game. He was telling me every touch. And I was like, he come all the way to Grimsby to watch me. Like, this is insane. And like, at the end of it, I'd signed the contract. It was, it was <laughs> the strangest man management I've ever known. Like, he's walked in. My agent's sitting there and he's gone, I don't like you. And I'm like, wow. And he's like, <laughs> not, not you personally. I just don't like agents. Got his chair, sat in front of him. Just spoke to me and my parents like for four or five hours and I'd okay. sign the contract after. That's see, that's insane. And like Bobby Robson is well known for his man management skills. He just had that way about him in terms of dealing with players. And he had to deal with quite a lot of players with that Newcastle team. Like you say, at the time, one of the biggest teams in Europe, I think you signed in 03, March of 03, 0203 season, they finished third in the Premier League, which is yeah. mad to think right now. Think about the personalities in the dressing room, whether it be Alan Shearer, uh, Craig Bellamy, Nobby Solano, Lauren Robert, Shea Given, like Premier League, like legends or icons mm. or cult figures. And you're a kid going into that dressing room. So talk about that in terms of when you turned up in Newcastle for the first day of training, you're surrounded by these superstars, they're the Champions League sides. How do you see yourself settling in? And did you settle in straight away? No, I didn't. And, and this is this is what I talk, spoke about earlier when I said I had the mentality as a young kid. I was cocky. I knew I was going to make it. Um, no one could tell me any different. But when I walked into that environment, I weren't ready. And I know this now. I know I weren't ready. Um, I kind of kept myself to myself. And I speak to a few of the lads now. I speak to Kieran Dyer sometimes. And and he says, you're such a different character now than you were when you arrived at Newcastle. And I don't know why. Something changed in my mentality that I don't know if I was nervous, I was shy. I kind of, I didn't fulfill my potential because I was mentally not strong enough to handle that environment. And I knew it. When I signed for Crystal Palace, I thought, I wish I was the character now when I signed for Newcastle because I'd have done a lot more in the game. I, I, I've, I'm proud of my career. Of course I am. But I'd have done a lot more because I wouldn't have been in awe of these players. I'd have felt, no, I'm one of them. So Bobby Robson's come yeah. to sign me. I should have had that in my mind. He's come to sign me. You know, he's given me a half decent contract. I'm, I'm in the first team dressing room. He signed a few that put him in the reserve dressing room. I was in the first team dressing room. I made my debut the weekend he signed me. So I should have had that in my mind. But for some reason... I wasn't strong enough. And it took me, I'd say, 18 months, two years before I really, my, my character started to, to come out. And, you know, it was too late by then. So Bobby Robson had left, Graham Souness was in, and I was already thinking about a move away. And I, I look back now with a lot of regret that I didn't go in there myself. I went in there as someone else. And I, 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 for the life of me, I couldn't tell you why now. Do you think part of that is because, you know, you, you, you were this larger than life character in Ipswich, you were a big fish, so to speak, in a little pond, and then you went into this dressing room full of superstars. Do you feel like it was because you went from being the main man to just, you know, having to prove yourself, do you think? Mm. I think so, yeah. I, I remember clearly, I mean, Kwaku knows me from the office. I'm, I'm not a shy character, you know, and... <laughs> I really was. And I remember... Mouthy. Mouthy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember clearly my first touch. We was... It was pre-season. Obviously, you get that little bit of banter when you're coming out. Oh, how much? How much? And stuff like that. And everyone... You know, they've got their eyes on you. They're thinking, is this guy good enough? And we was doing volley. And we was just running around. There was a few players doing a volley. And I went to volley. And I've clipped my other foot with my right foot. I clipped my left foot. And landed flat on my face. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I tried to hit my left foot and it went under. Like, so the volley went under my left foot. And I was like, I, I, I just couldn't fathom what was going on. It was like I wasn't a footballer anymore. It was like my ability had totally gone. I made my first team start against Birmingham uh, at St Andrews. 
I pick the ball up 20 yards out and everyone who has seen me play, look, there'll be people going, who is this guy you're talking to? But anyone who's seen me play knows I love to shoot. And I played like a two yard pass to Gary Speed. He ended up scoring and I was buzzing because I, you know, I had, I had an assist, but then I, I got home and my parents and my, my wife was going, why didn't you shoot? Like, although you got the assist and it was brilliant, you're good enough to shoot there. And I was like, I don't know why. I just played a two yard pass to my left and Gary Speed shot from almost the same position, you know? So it was, it was a weird one. I kind of, I weren't myself and, and I knew it and I knew it. I know, know it more now. I've, I've obviously grown up and, and evolved it into a character. <laughs> And you see that development in terms of like, like with you in the media, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and Jamie's going to talk about your life post Newcastle. But before we move on, I do want to talk about, in my estimation, the greatest, the greatest football film of all time is Goal. Your time <laughs> in Newcastle was when Goal was released. You make a little cameo in the film. There's rumour has it you're supposed to have a speaking part in it. So talk about what it was like being involved in Goal. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> it's a stitch up, Craig. It's a stitch up. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, we, we've had, right, we, we're, we're having a film being filmed. We're, we're going to be in a movie. And, and we're like, okay, like, what is it? It's a football movie. Now we know there's not many good football movies. And they're like, no, this is the main one. The, the guy, I can't even remember his name from Face Off was in it. Kieran Knightley was in it, I think. And um, it was like, wow, they've all turned up. Massive camera crews. And we're like, this is insane. I'm not going to lie. The main actor, uh, I think. Santiago Munez. Santiago Munez, yeah. So bad at football. Like, <laughs> the, I mean, I say I, I started poorly. He was, he when it, I, I, I don't even know how he got the lead actor in a football film. They made it look so good compared to what he was like. We used to do finishing sessions after European games. They'd travel away with us. He couldn't, he couldn't even kick the ball. Uh, they made it look like he was unreal. The winning goal was actually Laurent Robert's free kick against Liverpool and they just dubbed his head on the top. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I've turned up, we've turned up, we're like, right, we're going to do a, uh, we're going to do a team meeting. And it's like, okay, he said, and, and they've called me, Kieran Dyer and Jermaine Jenis. And they're like, right, you're, you, you three are going to have speaking parts. I was like, oh yeah, brilliant. Like, it was a, it was about a year into it. So I was starting to come out myself a little bit more. I'm like, okay, yeah, brilliant. I'll, I've got a speaking part in a film. And um, so we, we're in a team meeting and, and I remember my lines clearly. And what I had to say was, um, he wasn't there obviously. So I'm like, question boss, where's Santiago? And I can see you two looking at me now thinking, how was that cut? Um, but it was- Oscar worthy, mate. Oscar worthy. But we've, we've gone up to him at the end, yeah. We've gone up to the, the, the producer and, and said, right, is this, is this going to be in, yeah? Like, and they're like, he loves it. He loves it. I, I can't remember the guy. And, and, and the answer, he was the he was the main oh. guy. Like he done Rain Rooney Street Soccer, and he's like they loved it. Yeah, so okay, brilliant. Um, um, unbelievable tech is that same guy, yeah. Same guy, yeah. He was the man that was saying that all the people, producers, everything, all love it. So we're keeping this in team meeting. Uh, by the way, it took me about eight takes to get that right. By the way, <laughs> can you believe that four words it took me eight takes? So no one told me. So I'm sat in the cinema when it's come out. I've got my missus, she's my wife now, but it's my missus back there, my girlfriend. I'm like sweating, thinking, here we go. She knows I've got a speaking part. And I'm thinking, right, like, so we get half hour into it, nothing happens, hour into it. I'm thinking the game's gone where the team meeting was before, but I'm thinking they must have utilised this somewhere else. Hour and a half, I'm starting to sweat. And my missus is looking at me, I can see her. And then the credits start rolling and she's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you're an idiot. Where, where's your part? Like, I've, I've, I've checked deleted scenes, nothing. So the Did only you... part I had in the film was me being on a reserve team list. And I was like, as my name. And I think I headed it once in a reserve game. Oh, I was, I was so Wait, embarrassed. That's, that's, that's a shambles. That's an absolute shambles. Absolutely. And I haven't seen Andy Answer since. And I'm still, <laughs> when I see him, I'm going to be having words with him. I'll tell you that. <laughs> did you make did you make the credits at the end of the film? I think so, yeah. I think I made a credit, yeah, but I, I didn't deserve to make the credit. I mean, that, <laughs> it was it was so embarrassing. And we say it now, every time we see it on the TV, or if it's in, I think it's in like the bargain bucket now in like HMVs and stuff. And my missus is like, ain't that the film you're in? It's like oh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> uh, obviously, yeah. that was the highlight of your career on uh, Time Side. <laughs> um, and uh, after the 0405 season, you kind of made made the move. You found a home at Charlton. 
Um, and obviously, the way you left Newcastle, I know that they were a huge club before and maybe they didn't have the best of seasons, but people remember you in Newcastle. You had some moments there as well. But really and truly, where people kind of remember you, where I remember you, is your time at Charlton, your time at Crystal Palace. You found a home at those, those two London clubs. So speak about your time at both of those clubs, maybe Palace in particular, because you'll really remember for your time, your three years at that club. Yeah, I mean, firstly, it was difficult to leave Newcastle because... I'd actually done okay last few. Like, I, I was there. Kieran Dyer, and Lee Bowie had the fight, and I'm sat in the in the stands because I weren't. I didn't even make the bench. I'm looking around, thinking Nicky Butter just got injured as well. I think there's no one else. Graham Sunes has got to play me like surely. And I did. I ended up getting the, the last eight games of the season. I think ended up scoring three or four goals. He called me in. He said, "Look, I didn't know like this was you as a player. Like I'd love you to stay, but I'd already spoken to, to Alan Kirbishley and." So I, I did leave and, and go there. I kind of, I looked at it as like a, a sort of step backwards to move forward again. I felt I could go there. They'd been in the Premier League nine, 10 years. Um, Alan Kirby, was a great respected manager. Benty had just signed there as well. So I'd have gone in there comfortable straight away. Uh, Matt Ollen was there, Herman O'Riderson. So a lot of people that I knew and I thought I could start again, basically. Premier League and then... It went well, first season, I think three or four Prem goals for, for my first full season. Um, I, I, I quite liked that, a few assists. And then at the end of the, end of the um, season, Alan Kerbis is like, oh, I'm, I'm leaving. And we're like, what? Like, and he's like, yeah. It was against Manchester United, it was at the Valley. And he's like, I'm going to do a speech now and tell everyone. And he did. He went out onto the pitch with a microphone, done a speech. Obviously, we were all gutted, particularly me, because I made the decision to move for... for Basically, because Alan Kirbishley was there, I was going to be playing all the time. And I'm thinking, oh, I've got again, I've got to deal with another manager coming in. Are they going to like me? Whatever goes through the player's head. And to be honest, Alan Pardew ended up coming in and, and I scored, I think, his first, first game against Fulham. I scored a, a goal and I'd done well under him, but we ended up going down. I think Ian Dowie was prior to Alan, um, Alan Pardew, but we ended up going down. And again... Mate, if, if I wrote a book, I'd call it hindsight because there's a lot of things in my career that I, I could have changed. And one of them was at the end, when we went down, I had an opportunity to go to Fulham. Fulham were languishing a little bit at the bottom of the league in the Prem. It was the year they stayed up last game of the season. Um, but I felt, no, no, I can stay at Cholton. There's probably a promotion on the cards because we had the best squad by a million miles in the, in the championship. Um, but it was kind of the wrong decision. We, we started really well, got into the playoffs, was there nearly all season and then fell off at the end. Fell off, didn't end up making the playoffs and Fulham stayed up. So it was one of those decisions that I felt, oh, if, if, if I had different advisors back then, I tell you, if I had a different agent, which I ended up changing, he would have advised me to leave and go to Fulham because yeah. stay in the Premier League. Once you're out of the Premier League for a year or two, you struggle to get back in. And I, I, I obviously did that. I was constantly working on a club that would get promotion because no Premier League would have taken me. I started my career in the Prem, went in the Championship. No other team would have. So that was the reason I went to Palace, really, because end of the season, last game of the season, didn't end too well at Cholton. I ended up getting booed by the home fans, which was always fun. Um, I had a loan spell at Ipswich. That, that's the reason, actually, I got booed. I had a loan spell at Ipswich. I got caught off guard, battered Cholton in the press because I thought I was signing for Ipswich. Jim McGilton ended up getting a sack. I went back to Cholton, got, got, <laughs> got, got abused for the last 10 games of the season, which weren't fun. Um, yeah, last game of the season, Neil Warnock phones me up, said, look, come and be the main man. Ben Watson had just left Palace. Come and take penalties, free kicks, goal kicks, throw-ins. He just said the lot. He was such a great guy, mate. Right, apart from Sir Bobby, my all-time favourite manager, and I did. And we almost done it. We was almost, we was seventh in the league. We was going for playoffs. We was pushing it. And we ended up getting in administration, which killed the yeah. season for us. Neil Warnock left. Victor Moses left. Everyone was just leaving. And it was, it, it was such a tough time because we was almost there. We was almost in the playoffs, but didn't materialise. Well, I think that the the one thing that Palace fans remember you most fondly for is the goal you scored at, at Man United. Talk us through that in in, in the cup. You're, you're 40 yards out, and you and you 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 know you've you've got the goal in front of you. You've got you know Man United surrounded by you. What goes through your head to shoot in that moment? Anger, really. I, I didn't start the game. <laughs> I didn't start the game, which was oh, 
it was like the day before we picked the team, Dougie Friedman picked the team and I was doing well in the league as well. I scored a few goals and uh, so I went to see him and just say like, what's, what's going on? I feel I've, I can give something for the team. Like I was always confident against bigger teams and the big games. And I understood what he said. He kind of said, look, we're going to we're gonna defend and we're going to counter with pace, with Zaha, with Scannell. Jermaine Easter was the quickest forward we had at the club. He was up top. We'll counter them. He said, if we need you, like, we'll bring you on. And so I was fuming. I, I, I took a bag of balls out with Jermaine Easter. He didn't do much. He was just feeding me. And I was blasting them from everywhere in the training pitch, like halfway lines, 40 yards, 30 yards. And they were going everywhere. Like we had this huge hedge. They were going over it. I, I had to have a massage on my quad because it was, uh, I thought I'd tore it. I thought, oh God, here we go. But yeah, so when when it, when he brought me on, it was kind of natural instinct really just to shoot because I'd been doing it the day before. And I picked it up about five minutes prior to that. And I looked up and although I love to claim it was David De Gea or Van der Sar or someone in goal as well, as better as Ben Amos in goal. Look, he was a good goalkeeper, of course, but he wasn't the main man. But I looked up and he was about eight yards off his line. So I thought, you know what? When I next get the ball, I'm not even going to look. Hopefully he's off his line. I'm just going to try and hit, hit it with a bit of dip. And when I hit it, obviously I knew it, it connected perfectly. Looked up, he was around four yards off his line at the time. And I thought, this, this, that's going in. So it was it was a great feeling to, to score. And uh, I, I didn't realise what kind of goal and athletically, athletic, I can't even say the bloody word, but what it, what it looked like <laughs> until, I, until I come off the pitch. I think the best thing about it is, I mean, I've, I've seen the clip is you don't necessarily go crazy. You kind of just run run around, you know, just kind of like, yeah, this is this is what I do. You know, it's very like it's very yeah. natural. Like you see players score from 40, 50 yards out and they, they lose their minds, you know, but for yourself, you know it's just like it's, it's not like I'm not patting myself on the back at all here, but I used to shoot all the time. Any player that, that would you tell that played with me, even in training, I would be shooting all the time to the point where people were like, Dad's passed the ball, please. Like the day, the game before QPR, I hit one similar distance and it hit the top of Holmesdale Road, and you know you get that groan. But that's why players that score good goals is because they they don't mind shooting. And they, I didn't mind the reaction, I didn't mind the boos, the groans, because I thought if I connect right, they're, they're going in. And you know I've got a nice, I've not got many trophies, in, well I've got no trophies in terms of like leagues and FA Cups, Carling Cups, and what that was back then, but. You know, I've got eight goal of the seasons. So, you know, I'm happy with them. I'm happy with the goal of the seasons. So we're talking about a guy who scores nice goals. When you go and watch the clip back of you banging in that 40 yard or at Old Trafford, you see a young Wolf Zaha celebrating with you. Obviously, Wolf's still going strong at Palace now, obviously stopped off at Man United. Didn't, didn't turn out well for him there. But talk about Wilf. Like, he's a player that splits the opinion. He's a player that divides opinion in modern football. Obviously, a, a great servant for Palace. Done amazing things for them whilst they've been in the Premier League. But maybe not appreciated by the wider world of football because of some of the histrionics on the pitch and stuff. So just talk about a player who's currently playing, who, in my opinion, is gravely underrated. Totally agree, Greg. I totally agree. For me, uh, when I talk about a list of players I've played with and top players I've played with, he's up there in the top three for sure. You know, and I, I didn't play with him at his very best as well. I played with him at a young age. Um, I remember him coming on when he was 16, I think. Um, Paul Hart was the manager. I brought him on. And um, you get to a stage when I was a senior player and we, we got off. He didn't change in our changing room, the first team. But I remember me, Sean Derry, Paddy McCarthy, Danny Butterfield. We was like, who is this kid? Like, he is special. So then he started to train with us and... The, the names I just mentioned there, Sean Derry's, Paddy McCarthy, Clint Hill, um, Matty Lawrence, Alan Lees, these were big characters, big, um, didn't want to be taken advantage of, didn't want the mickey taken out of them in training. And that's all Wilf would do. You know, he'd be nutmegging them. And there's, there's n you couldn't get near him. You couldn't get near him. They'd be trying not to injure him as such, just to put him in his place a little bit, but you couldn't get near him. And that's when you think, now this, this kid's special. And I've said it many, many times. If, if Sir Alex Ferguson didn't leave Manchester United, he wouldn't have returned to Crystal Palace. He'd be up there with one of the best players in Europe still. And I think he's gravely underrated, as you said. 11 goals already in the Premier League again this season at a Palace team. Um, so one of the best players I've played with 
not most naturally gifted as well and all right he's a bit petulant at times but that's passion you know he, he was like that in training he just wants to win I don't know why he divides opinion so much I, I really don't and, and, and it's sad because he'll never change you'll never change the way he is and he's, he's, a, he's a fantastic player and he's a he's a great guy as well yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, he's he's one of those uh, players that gets you out of your seat. And for any football fan like myself, that's what, you know, as a neutral, that's what you want to see. I mean, like I said, I mean, not to disrespect Palace in any sort of way, because they're certainly going in the right direction with the stewardship of, uh, or under the stewardship of Patrick Vieira. But do you feel like it's too late in his career now to to get that big move to a big club? Or do you feel like he'll, he'll see out the rest of his career at Crystal Palace? I, I, I don't think it's too late for him to move to a big club. I think he's shown again, like I said, this season, the ability he has, um, 11 goals again. There was always a question mark about his end product and could he add goals to his games? And he's done that. And we had him on, on the boot room, actually. We had a Zoom call of him. And he said, like, he got to a point where he felt, no, I want to be more selfish. Why should I win the penalties and give them to Luka Milivojevic to take? I'm going to take them. Like I'm confident enough. I'm good enough to take them. I'm getting questioned for goal scoring I need to step up and that's exactly what he's done and I think I called about two or three years ago I said he could play in any team and I still believe that I don't think he'd make teams worse but it, on the flip side to that I, I, I do think he may end his career at Palace which for a for a neutral I think that's disappointing I'd love to have known how far he could have gone in the game I think he could have gone very far Okay, it didn't work out Manchester United. That happens. He was young. Circumstances arose with Sir Alex leaving. Uh, so I'm disappointed I didn't get to see how far he could go. But, you know, Crystal Palace are pushing forward, as, as yeah. we know. Different to when Roy was there. Patrick, if he stays, I think Wilf will most certainly look to stay. And who knows how far he can take his, his boyhood club, as it were. Yeah, well, there's, there's multiple clubs that are looking to push forward. And I think it will be how... Uh, Crystal Palace move forward when people like Conor Gallagher go back to Chelsea and how they recruit in the summer. Uh, you mentioned uh, a minute ago, obviously, Will Zaha being one of the best players you've ever played with, being in your top three. Out of interest, who are the other top two, I'd say? Well, will you turn to? Oh, I mean, it changes quite often, actually, but I'm going <laughs> to put I'm going to put the two centre forwards, Alan Shearer, just because it's Alan Shearer, you know, 260 Prem goals. And more top flight goals as well, because he was in the old first division. So that would have been more if that was the Premier League. He was just, he dug me out of a few holes as well when I made a few mistakes. He'd come and score a few, which dug me out. And the other one, Patrick Cliver. And he he was coming towards the end of his career at New, when he signed for Newcastle. So I didn't, again, I didn't get to see him at his very best. But what I did see was a special talent. And for a midfield player to, to have a forward that you can bounce it off at any angle, any speed, any height, and he just bring it out the air like it was nothing, you know, and, and just find you whenever you wanted the ball. You know, he was a great guy as well. Um, you, know, honorable, you know what? I'm going to say honourable mention to Darren Bent as well, um, because and not just because I worked with him in the media. Growing up, we grew up since we was 11, he was probably one of the best finishers I've ever played with. Like, he would score so many. You know, he's in a 100-goal club. And he, unlike me, he stayed at Ipswich the amount of time that he should have. And he utilised his ability to, to, to have an England career, to, to score as many goals as he did. But in terms of finishing, he was right up there with, with Shearer, in my opinion. So, And Kieran Dyer, if it weren't for injuries, he'd have over 100 England caps, million percent. Yeah, yeah he, he, he's unbelievably talented, Kieran Dyer. Um, before we kind of wrap things up, obviously, me and you know each other from our work at Talksport and like within the media. You made that pr that pretty seamless transition from from playing into the media. Was that always something that was on your mind, like come the end of your career, that you want to kind of get in front of the screen or in front of the microphones, as opposed to on the touchline? Like, tell us about how that transition from being a player into being a member of the media worked. Uh, you know what? It, it wasn't. It was never in my mind. It is is crazy, really. I always wanted to go into the coaching world, and I'd done my level two when I was playing, and I started to do my level uh, my UEFA B license, and kind of got a little bit bored and a little bit um, kind of why why do I have to be doing this? Like this isn't how I'm going to be coaching if I ever become a coach. And I I'd done the under tens and elevens at Ipswich. 
didn't enjoy it that much. And and you know what? It, it was Benty. He he'd been trying to push me into the media for a long time. He's done it a lot longer than me. I'd always been told that I'm a half decent talker from press officers wherever I've been. So he rang me up, Daz, and said, "Look, I've." got this new show coming, um, Darren Bent's boot room. They said, look, can I find guests? Do you want to be one of the guests? So I said, yeah, no problem at all. So I, I got in there, done the show, loved it. Um, said a few things, clipped up, absolutely abused all over social media. And I thought, yeah, this is back to how I liked it. I used to love this. So, uh, and, and then I got a call off, off, off the main guys and said, look, like if, if you want it, like it's yours for the season. So I was delighted because it kind of fell into place. And I was never thinking even now how how it would evolve as it as it has because then Sky Sports have come in, BT Sport. I've done work for companies abroad, and as, as you said, as we've discussed before, like we work together a lot, and I seem to be the go-to guy now at, at Talk Sport. I, I'm in a lot of a lot of days in the week, and absolutely love it. Like honestly, I hear people talk about it's a grind and some jobs they have is, is difficult. This is the best job. Like apart from me being a football player, this is the best job that I, I could have thought about having. And I'm, I'm lucky. I'm privileged to be, to be involved. Honestly, I really am. Well, Darren, I think that's the best way to, to round it up. And uh, we thank you ever so much for coming on today. I mean, everyone knows who you are. You're Darren Ambrose, but where can they find you on socials, you know, and, and direct that abuse as I used to. Yeah, obviously, I'm Darren Ambrose84 on Twitter and I'm Mr. Ambrose84 on Instagram. I've not got many followers, actually. I started, I started late. I started late because I wouldn't have handled the, the abuse as well as I do now. I tell you that. But yeah, I want to get I want to get as many followers as I can. Oh, man, we'll go give Darren a follow. He's been uh, good today. And Quaker, where can you uh, where can they find us? Um, yeah, Dan, I just want to say thank you. Obviously, at the top of this, you uh, complimented me, but truly, you are definitely one of the hardest working people in the building, man, all over the place. Like, we were in Manchester the other week, then you come back to where you live to work, like, five, six, seven days a week, man. So you're you're grafting it and you're smashing it as well. Thank so you. thank you for coming on and uh, credit to yourself, mate. Um, but yeah, if you want to follow us, we're on Twitter at WTF Podcast 90. We're on Instagram at We Talk Football Podcast. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel and we'll be back with more videos very, very soon. Cheers, guys. Catch you next time.